Hey all right, everyone, welcome to the Sixth Provider Podcast. Very lucky to have with me today a fellow Tyra local and a good mate of mine. Um, he's a he's a natural history filmmaker. He shoots Fish of the Day with Clark Gayford. Um, he's been on all sorts of adventures over his lifetime. And uh, welcome to the podcast, Mike Barner. Cheers, mate. Good to be here. Good to be here. I've uh, got a nice... Nice sunny, tighter a day. The wind's blowing a little bit, but um, she's a pretty magic day nonetheless. Every day in Tyra is magic, mate. Sure is. So, um, Mike, recently you've um, put out a pretty um, telling documentary on the state of the New Zealand fishery called The Price of Fish. That's primarily what we're going to talk about today. Um, before we do that, um, I sort of maybe touch on what your career has entailed to date, and you've done some amazing things in your time, largely centred around um, the ocean and documenting the ocean and, um, and trying to preserve it. Um, what, what led you down this career? Well, I started off at, uh, at university um, doing marine biology and quickly realised that um, that was going to take me nowhere in terms of the career path. Yep. You know, there was, I suppose, about 20 in our class coming through and most of them ended up being barmen. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I... I sort of, I, I love telling stories, it was a big part of who I was, so yeah. I switched and went to journalism, and, yeah. uh, and, but always still had that, that love of the ocean. The reason why I wanted to do marine biology is I wanted to be engaged in the ocean somehow, um, and, uh, but that path just didn't seem to be working once I got into it. Um, so I changed to journalism and, uh, and sort of got my head around storytelling, and uh, yeah. used that as a vehicle to get in. Started off in print magazines, I was working in, um, Adventure magazine and surfer magazine and skier magazine, so special interest magazines yep. for probably close to seven or eight years. Yep. And then when three started up in 1990, I saw an opportunity to work in there, having knowing a lot of the sports people that I was working with at the time through the magazines. Um, I started work for their sports department, but ultimately I wanted to get back to the ocean. So I used that as a lever. I had a, a great mentor at three in the first years, um, and. Uh, he sort of led me down that path. I said, look, I want to make documentaries. I want to make natural history documentaries. He laughed. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and I kept on at him. And he, and he sort of said, okay, well, these are the things you need to work through. So um, I needed to learn about storytelling um, from a moving uh, picture point of view, not just yeah. from stills and from and from uh, print. Yeah. And I needed to get my head around, uh, you know, turning things over reasonably fast, which television is about as well. So I went through, I worked with... Uh, obviously with sports, I worked with news, I worked with current affairs, and then uh, I was lucky enough to get a documentary idea off the ground with three, probably in 92, yep. on sharks in New Zealand. Yep. And that started me on that path, and then I went on in the year, years to date, I've made I think, close to 30 films on sharks. Wow. So, yep. you know, the, the thing about getting into any industry is trying to find a, um, a gap or a way to get into that, that as a career. And what I saw was that there was no one in the country at that stage doing anything with sharks. Yeah. So yeah. I felt, well, um, there's, a, there's a window of opportunity. So, um, and because we're all ocean orientated, every school holidays, every holiday that we have as children is almost always orientated around the ocean. So sharks are a fascination for most people. Yeah, so I, that was I, the opportunity. I guess a large part of that fascination um, has been fear, the likes of jaws. And, yeah. Um, I've noticed and I've seen some of your footage, you spend a lot of time in the water face to face with sharks, not in cages, but actually free swimming with sharks. How how do you like it are you actually scared in that environment and how do you how do you get around that um, that, that fear and is it, I think, is it I think anyone who says they're not scared when they come face to face with a big big predator is a liar. Yeah. I think that <laughs> it it's about how you manage that fear. So um, when when you're filming wild animals, you know, the, the first thing you got to remember about sharks is they're far more intelligent than people give them credit for. Any predator has to be smarter than its prey. When I mean, you're talking about something like a white shark who will hunt and kill dolphins, yeah. um, who eat seals, that predator has to be smarter than the prey items that it's attacking. So they're, they're, they're very smart animals. Yeah. So you need to understand the animals and you need to understand those behavioral traits before you spend time in the water with them. And then you've got to manage a whole bunch of other things. So it's very easy for us with a big camera to get completely focused on what you're doing from a filmmaker's point of view. But there's two other really important things is one, you've got to have your eye on the behavior of the animal. 
to see and make sure that he doesn't start exhibiting behavior that may get you into trouble. Yeah. The other thing is you've got to be really aware of your own physical well-being because sharks have incredibly fine-tuned senses. And if you, if you start breathing hard or working hard, your heart rate accelerates, he's going to sense that. So, um, and, and most of the time he's trying to work out whether you're another predator or whether you're prey. And if your heart rate starts to accelerate, then his uh, thoughts about what you might be might change. Yeah. So manage yourself when you're in the water. If, yeah. if we work too hard in the current, I'll get out of the water if I, my heart rate starts to come up. Yeah. Um, be aware of what the behavior is of the animal. And, uh, and then the third thing is focusing on trying to get your, your, uh, your footage. But you have to have a good understanding of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of the work you've done has gone in a large way to, uh, I guess, raising the awareness of um, issues like shark finning and, and the plight of the Marco shark. What, what, yeah. what changes have you seen in the last I mean, 10 years? Well, if you, if you go back, the first film on Marco sharks I did was uh, 93, and we did another one in 96. And in those years, we could go out, you know, uh, a classic example, we'd go out to film them off the West Coast out over the Manukau Bar. This is only um, 96, so what's that? Uh, nearly 25 years ago? Yeah. Um, our first job at dawn would be go out and find the yellowfin tuna. We'd jig a couple of yellowfin tuna with an old Grim Reaper lure. Yeah. We'd put one in the boat on ice to take home. Yeah. And we'd use the other one for burley. Yeah, yeah, those are the yeah, days yeah. when we, had, we actually had, had yellowfin. yellowfin. And, and then we'd head out, and we, we worked with Marco Sharks over four or five seasons. Um, and during that time, we could go out, we could get between three and 20 in a day on a regular yeah. basis. Yeah. Then by um, the sort of mid-2000s, the numbers of animals had just plummeted. Um, and same with Blue Sharks. We were seeing a rapid decline in numbers of animals when we were going out looking for them for filming. Um, and that brought about that, that need for us to look at what was happening to them and looking at shark finning. We got together with a group of uh, the NGOs. We all uh, sat around the table, worked out what we needed to do, and took that process through to government and, uh, and had shark finning banned in New Zealand. Yep. Since then, we've seen the numbers of those animals go back up again. Awesome. So, yeah, so we're, we're seeing healthy numbers of Marcos and Blues. Quite often, those animals that we see out here are carrying hooks from the long liners. So, the liners are getting them up, they, they're cutting them off as they and should be, go, yeah. and letting them go. And eventually, those hooks will rust out. So. Interesting, they caught a um, marlin this year that had a long line hook. Oh, right, yeah. yeah in its mouth. So, yeah, obviously that had, that had been released in a nice, healthy state, which is uh, it's always it's good to see. It is good to see. It is good to see, yeah. yeah. Um, what's, what's, you've you've uh, told me a few stories um, over the years, and uh, I think one that's stuck in my mind is nearly getting blown up by some dynamite fishing in the Philippines. Is that, is that the craziest thing that's ever, ever happened to you? Well, you've been in the water filming. What? Oh, in the water, yeah, it was probably one of them. There's, we did some testing of um, the uh, the shark shields that they're called nowadays. They were shark pod out of South Africa back in the day. Yeah. And when Shark Shield took them over in Australia, we did a lot of the testing and filming of them working around Great Whites for the for the company. Yep. Um, that led us to some pretty on edge filming outside yep. of cages with big Great Whites, yep. and we had wow. one close call with a solid sort of five and a half meter female, yeah. um, where we had the uh, shark shield strapped to a whole bluefin tuna, like the f most favorite, the best food you could possibly offer. Yeah, yeah, right. And we had the shield strapped to the, uh, to the tuna. And the couple of white sharks were going around, they'd only come within about two or three meters, you'd see them hit the field and they'd flinch and, and move away. Yeah. And so we'd ventured out and we were underneath the, the, um, the tuna, filming it, and uh, this big female turned up. And the first run she did at the tuna, she got about two and a half metres away and she turned and we just like this, yeah, it's working, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she went around another time, she came in about 1.8 metres and she came about 1.6 metres and she came about 1.5 metres and she'd wince every time she hit the field. And then you just saw her turn around and she just dropped her pin, fins and just went, you know what, I'm going to have that to her. Wow. And just came through and cleaned up the whole thing. So Including the shark shield. Including the shark shield. Ate it. the whole bloody <laughs> thing, yeah, yeah, so... And we had to get back from outside the cage into the cage while she was uh, she was in full feeding mode. So, wow. so yeah, but probably the scariest stuff I've done over the years is you kind of you get you spend so much time in the ocean. You know that one of the things we have to be really careful of is of getting complacent. Whether you're a skipper, um, whether you're filming sharks, whatever it is, it's very easy when you're on the water every day to become complacent about the really yep. simple things. And I felt that from a filming point of view, I I kind of done I've done so much and. I felt a couple of times where um, 
I was being a little bit blase about the, going through that process of checking and double checking and triple checking stuff. And I thought I'd step outside my comfort zone and do something a little bit different. So I ended up making a series called Hope and Hell um, about Red Cross workers under fire. So I put the fins away for a year yeah. and a half and yeah. I went to war zones and disaster areas. Yeah. And that was without question the scariest stuff I've ever done in my life. You know, walking into places like Liberia and West Africa, um, wow. into Afghanistan. Um, we went into Band Aceh after the Boxing Day tsunami. And then dealing with all yeah. that sort of stuff brings you back to reality, you know, and you come back here to pretty old New Zealand and go, yeah, it's pretty good down here. Yeah, we're pretty, pretty lucky, aren't, aren't we? Now, you've, you've always, I think, called Tyra home. You've been, been had an association with Tyra since I've known you and you've moved back here recently. What, um, what is it about Tyra that makes you call it home and, and I think, want to live here? I think it's a bunch of things. I mean, we travel, I've spent most of my life away for eight months of the year. And over the last 30 years, while I've been making documentaries, probably six or eight months of that time is overseas. And I've visited some amazing places. Some of the Pacific Islands, other destinations, just stunning. But New Zealand's got the X factor. And it doesn't matter where you go. There's lots of places overseas I'd say, I wouldn't mind living there, I wouldn't mind living there. There's nothing like New Zealand as, as a place to live and grow up and raise families. And I suppose within New Zealand, you're looking at, trying to find all of that, that perfect combination. It's got to be good for family. You've got to have a good community of people, of yeah. support, of yeah. whānau, of, of friends. Um, and, you know, you just got to have a, a team of good bastards around you. And Tyra is one of those places. Yeah. And then on our doorstep, we've got this. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. So, yeah, we're just looking out at the Alderman Islands as, yeah. as we speak. Yeah. What, um, yeah, what a magnificent playground we've got out here. And... Um, you know, you don't have to go that far and you, you've got pretty good cray fishing just off the beach. Scallops not too far away. Yeah. Kingfish yeah. not too far away. And if you, uh, yeah, if you feel like you want to go offshore, you've got the Aldermans and amazing game fishing most of the year now. Mm. The introduction of bluefin tuna into the mix. Yeah, well, that's right. There's, there's just, everything's right here on our doorstep. And it's just, you know, you, you drop down the bottom of where we live, um, put the boat in the water. And in five minutes, you can have a feed of crayfish. You can be, you know, on a good-sized kingfish. You can be, or you can take, you know, the, the half an hour, three quarters an hour to go out to the Ottomans. And you've yep. got one of the best dive sites, I think, in the entire world yep. right there. And uh, for me, from a filmmaking point of view, being able to go out there and shoot stock footage and, and spend time just searching out those little gems, um, it's just such a great playground. Yeah. And I, th I think that really comes into the fore in years like we're just having. And health, health and well-being is like right at the top of everyone's, I guess, mindset. Yeah. Um, I've, just, I've just spent um, you know, this a reasonably lean year as far as tourism goes. So I've spent um, a large part of this year studying a health coach course and lots of components that I'm learning about diet and you look at fishing. We've got access to some of the best protein in the world and some of the best fat sources in the world. You've got um, nature and fresh air and the ability to get out and move and exercise and without having to go and lock yourself in a gym. And I think that's, that's the big, that is the big decider that, that all of this is right here on our doorstep. And we, we've, we've got ourselves, the, the whole world has got ourselves into this, this, um, this neoliberal way of thinking where we need more money, we need more, we need more. But we need to stop, we need to take time, we need to breathe. And places like this allow you to do that. You know, you, you've got time in the weekends to spend with your family. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got time each day. You're not driving an hour to yeah. work and an hour back. Exactly. You're straight back with your family, you're straight back with your kids. You're going to the beach, you're going out, you know, with my three and a half year old collecting crabs in the rock pools and doing all that really cool stuff. That if, they, if you're in Auckland, they'll be on the PlayStation. So. Yeah, there's there's so much here that gives you a greater sense of well-being, yeah. and and fishing, as you said, I mean, fishing is inextricably linked to who we are culturally. Yeah, it's a part of us. Every memory for me as a kid growing up was out here fishing with dad and a little thirteen foot six sea nymph. Yeah, you know, and and it's those memories that you know we want to make sure we 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 hand on to our kids and to our grandkids. Exactly. Which leads us on to the price of fish, the documentary that you've just made. It aired on on three on the twenty sixth of July. I happen to be down at Waiho Bay 
at the time, catching bluefin tuna, and we sat down and ate a plate of bluefin sashimi in the sun while we watched the documentary. Nice. I thought it was fantastic, very tight, um, just struck a chord with everything I think I've always thought about um, how the fishery is managed in New Zealand. I think one of the stats that stuck out for me is um, with the current quota management system, 78% of the fishery is now essentially owned or controlled by 10 companies. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and that's right there is the problem. Um, you know, the, the problem is not commercial fishermen, it's not wreck fishermen. Yeah. What it is, is having fish in the water for us all to catch and a system that allows people to, to have a livelihood in, in going fishing as well. And when you've got big companies owning the lion's share of that, that's, that's when things start to fall to bits. Because who, who, owns, owns who actually owns the fishery out here? Well, that, that, that's the reality. We come back, let's, let's come back to who the fish belong to. Yeah. The fish are a common property resource. And as a common property resource, they belong to all New Zealanders. The government has a responsibility with common property resources to manage them on our behalf. And when the QMS first came in, um, it was uh, Colin Moyle was the Minister of Fisheries, and there's a wonderful letter out where he states that, okay, this is how the QMS is gonna work, but our priority will always be that wreck and, and, uh, and customary fishing comes before commercial fishing. Yeah. And the, the, the problem with the system that we brought in the QMS is it basically gave property rights over a common property resource which just doesn't happen in anything other than in fisheries. And it's a bizarre thought to think that you can, suddenly you had, you know, whatever you had, uh, uh, the companies that were catching the most amount of fish before the QMS came in, got the most amount of quota, they got it for free, and they got it in perpetuity forever. Which is a bizarre thought. It's pretty pretty good investment to uh, have in your back pocket, isn't it? <laughs> well, a lot, a lot of them saw it coming, and, uh, and we're, we're over-catching everything yeah. in order that they, uh, they got an opportunity to... Uh, to have that ownership going forward. Yeah. yeah. And when you think about a cray fisherman now who, um, if, he's, if, he, if you don't own that quota, and very few of them do, and you, you are leasing that from one of those big companies, um, to buy that quota yourself would, would cost you over a million dollars a tonne. Yeah. So, and, and that's, they're our fish. <laughs> they're actually, and they belong to It's an essential part of our well-being. It's, you, you could equate it to the water we drink or that. Yeah, we breathe. So, yeah, someone clicking the ticket on the air that I breathe out there is quite a bizarre sort of uh, well, it thing is. to think yeah. about. Yeah. I fully understand um, reimbursing for someone for going out and catching it and the effort they put into um, going out and fishing it for and catching it. But I think one of the one of the terms I kept hearing in the documentary was the term armchair fishermen. There's a whole lot of people there just... Um, yeah clipping the ticket in perpetuity for the hard work a lot of the commercial grassroots commercial fishing they're doing it. Yeah, and they're, they're not getting the reward for what they do. Um, fishing should be a livelihood. You know, it, when, it, when it comes to Māori, fishing is a part of who we are as a, as a culture. I mean, yeah. as all Polynesians, the primary source of protein has always been fish. Um, for that to be stripped away from us is, is a ridiculous notion. Um, the, the ability for people to go out and fish and to be able to catch fish for a living that should be a number one priority. You should be creating jobs, yeah. um, not creating companies with bigger boats that create less jobs. So yeah, if you, well, yeah, I think like with Tyra, for example, um, I look out here at the water. I, you know, I've spent the last 15, 20 years on the water making a living, and so I see what goes on out there. And even perched up on the hill, I can see lots of boats. Yep. And yeah, there's so yeah, many commercial yeah. boats fishing yeah. our waters, yet as a community, we've only got one commercial fisherman, and he's a cray fisherman, that lands any fish yet. Yeah. So the economic benefit from anyone com commercially fishing in our waters out here is ne negligible. No, and, and, and you can't, from a community point of view, uh, and we really noticed this during lockdown, People like yourself and myself went out and stocked up before it happened. Yeah. So we, we had a reasonable stock of fish in the, yeah. in the fruit. But for anybody else in town, you couldn't buy fish. There was, there's no supermarket here that's supplying fresh fish out. And it makes you think about that opportunity ongoing. Like the restaurants here in Tyra, we have some of the best fish right on our doorstep. And those restaurants are often bringing the fish in from Auckland. Yeah. 
because they can't buy it off the wharf. What we should have is we should have a half a dozen little artisanal style fishing um, families here, running small boats, hook and line, not yep. trawling, bottom trawling or, or uh, purse seining, going out, catching fish, go into the Tyro chit chat on the way yep. back in, say, hey, yep. look, I've got 200 kilos of snapper and, and 50 kilos of gurnet or whatever it yep. might be, and you should be able to go down that wharf and buy that fish for a realistic price. Yeah. If you took out that middleman out of that equation, I mean, you're talking about fishermen here at the moment, they're getting between 5 and $8 a kilo for snapper. And yet, you, if you go and try and buy that at the supermarket, you're going to be paying close to $40. And if you take that middle sector out, still putting in money for research and management yeah. and for tax, because we need to see something back as the owners of that fish. So there should yeah. be a tax on the fish being yeah. caught. Yeah. Um, that price of the fish should be at half of what it is. And that affects our well-being. And then you talk about places like South Auckland where you've got um, major issues with diabetes, with, uh, with obesity, um, and the, the main protein that we would eat every day if we could, fish, isn't accessible because it's too expensive. Yeah. And that's just ridiculous. And the strain on our health system as a result of that yeah. is, is phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to use... Um yeah, the snapper is a good example. Like I was in New World a few weeks ago and um, snapper was actually $45 mm. a kilo. I happened to ask the person behind the counter um, where it was caught and um, it, where it was caught and who caught like what fishermen caught it and they had no idea. They pretty much said it came in a, it comes in a box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, gets, yeah. it comes in a truck, in a box. Yeah. And I know, I know full well that it all come through leaf fishery foodstuffs own. Yep. Um, so it's not caught locally. Yet the local commercial fishermen who slog their butts off out there on the water are getting, like you say, anywhere between three fifty and five dollars yep. a kilo for their snapper. And that's going offshore. It's not accessible to the to the local market. That's just um, it's completely nuts at the end of the day. It is, it is. <laughs> and, and and the fact that the fish that you're buying from the supermarket is going to be, if it, if it hasn't been frozen at some point, it's going to be anywhere from sort of three to eight days old by the time you get to eat it. When we should be able to go down the wharf and buy that fish, fresh off the boat, yeah. caught within hours, straight onto the plate. Yeah. And that's, that's where I think we need to be looking to from, for the future of fisheries. We need yeah. to move back to those small um, regional fishing ports. We need to see non-invasive fishing methods like hook and line, we need to see the populations of our fish back up to what they call MSY, which is closer to 50% of original biomass. Yeah. Um, you know, imagine if, imagine if that were the case. Imagine if the, every one of the species that is down around that 20 or 25, 30% of biomass was up to 50%. How many more fish would there be in the ocean? Yeah. And how much easier would it be for us to, uh, to go out there and get a feed? And for the, for the commercial guys to go out there and make a living. Yeah. So. In your documentary, you, you pretty much travelled around the world talking to anthropologists, economists, scientists, doctors, politicians. They were all pr reasonably unanimous in saying the QMS, which is a form of uh, the ITQ system, does not work. And we've had it for 30 years. It does not actually, seems to be failing. Um, why, why has there been no change? Um, there's a number of reasons for that. The yeah. first, the first is just basic laziness. Um, it, it takes, it will take a lot of work to overhaul the system, change the system, bring something new in. When the QMS first came, the other thing we've got to remember too is that that um, under the Treaty of Waitangi, there's some pretty big um, uh, uh, dealings that need to be done from an iwi point of view to make sure that uh, iwi are involved in any movement in terms of changing of uh, of how we manage our fisheries. When the QMS first came out. Māori was completely left out of it. And suddenly, retrospectively, after eight years of fighting, we came up with the Māori Fisheries Act, um, and basically, Māori was given a pile of shares in the yeah. QMS, which was paper shares and something they already basically owned because it was a common property resource. Yeah. It, was like, it was like blankets for land all over again. Yeah. And that, that, uh, the value for that has never really returned. I mean, we don't see trickle down and we certainly don't see jobs. And the jobs, I think, is the, is the thing you've got to come back to, the fundamental, most important part. Because for a lot of New Zealanders, if you live in a small rural town like here or you're in the far north, the opportunity to go fishing doesn't exist. You can get a job working on a big trawler 
um, based out of Wellington or based out of Auckland and disappear for a month or two away from home, there's no opportunity for you and your family to stay in your community and make a, a living out of fishing. Yeah. And that's probably the biggest thing that we, we got from those social anthropologists was the impact that has on small towns, on well-being. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the loss or the, that, that um, sucking away of the young um, uh, people out of communities because they've got to go and look for jobs elsewhere when there's jobs right there on the doorstep that yep. just aren't being utilised correctly. And bef uh, like bef before we had the story, I was thinking back about who who I know or have known in the commercial industry, and I've got I've got so many friends from from school and just who I've met over the years while I've been charter fishing. I got that many mates that have been in the commercial sector. A lot a lot of them aren't in there anymore, and they're, they're some of the nicest, just salt of the earth people that. They're connected to nature. They're good business people, but a lot of them have actually chosen to go and do other things because at the end yeah. of the day, you've got to, got to make a living and got to put a roof over your head for your whānau. Yeah, and it shouldn't be that hard. Yeah, yeah. It shouldn't be that hard. And and if you, you know, and, and I think that's the big thing about where we go to from here. That, and, and one of the things we explored in that documentary is it's all very well for us to kick up our hands and go, this is terrible and we've, we've, you know, it's wrong and New Zealand's been wrong. But where do you go to from here? Yeah. What do you what do you replace the QMS with? Um, that you know, and I look carefully at whether you could take the QMS and more carefully manage it. Government get more involved in in making sure that figures like, for instance, um, you know, the uh, the amount of uh, scallop the TAC or total commercial uh, catch TACC for scallops. If the scallop population has gone through the floor like it has right around our country, then the quota should be set so that the fish stock can bounce back yep. to that MSY. And yet you have a look at what we've got in the in terms of our current um, TACC for scallops, and it's up here somewhere where the catch is way down here. And so it's not working. And and while those so big the businesses- commercial guys aren't even coming close to- Oh, I'm not even TACC close. Yet. Not yeah. even close. And, and you could say that there are other factors involved, like um, uh, whether the markets uh, can take the stock, but when you talk yeah. about things like scallops and crayfish and, and power and harpooka and and uh, and tiriki, there's no shortage of demand for yeah. those top end species. Yeah. The problem is finding the fish. Yeah. So that that system needs to change, and I don't think we're going to be able to modify the QMS to make it work. As long as there's property rights in there, those companies are going to fight tooth and nail to the end. The ultimate solution is to get rid of the QMS. The ultimate solution is for the government to buy back all of that quota, um, probably starting just with that insure, protect that insure, and then reallocate under a resource rental-based system where we allow the stocks to return to reasonable levels. Yep. We micromanage the areas. There should be, we, our fishermen should just fish this area here. We shouldn't have guys from Carolina, from Auckland, and from Northland coming and fishing yep. over the top. Once you've got it micromanaged, once you've got small operators, and the other thing you don't want is slipper skippers. You don't want people in offices in Auckland with a share yeah. in our fish. Yeah. What you want is the people who are fishing with that. Yeah. And if and if you're not fishing, you shouldn't be getting a return on fish. That way, the locals, the locals and the local restaurants are going to get first dibs. Yeah. Then the rest of New Zealand and yeah, it's it does seem all about us about face that um, the premium stock gets sent overseas. Exactly, and, and like when you, you look what at what is left over, should go to the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah, well, even even some of the stuff that's being shipped overseas. I mean, you've got projects like Kaika, like Legacy's Kaika program, supplying fish heads and frames into South Auckland. They can't get enough. Yeah. There's so much demand for people in South Auckland to get a good meal. Yeah, and yet we ship off things like Jack Mac and uh, and Slimy Mac off to uh, off to Africa for about a dollar fifty, a dollar eighty a kilo. Yeah, that fish should be going to the local market. There should be no export for fish of a value of less than five or 10 bucks per kilo into yeah. that international market. Yeah. It should stay yeah. right here yeah. because it's all about feeding us. One of the things that COVID's taught us is, um, you know, we, we spent time last year in Hawaii and we talked with some of the aquaculture people up there about the value of aquaculture to Hawaii. And one of their biggest concerns is if the trade routes stop for Hawaii, if they got cut off from the mainland, they've got three weeks worth of food left. The great thing about New Zealand is we actually produce, our primary industries produce an incredible 
wealth of food. And what we don't want to do is get in a situation where we, we lose that, whether it's degradation of environment, like you know, falling off of rivers, of over farming, of overfishing. If yeah. we can manage that, we will have always going forward the best resource you could ever sell internationally yeah. because people are always going to want food. So if we manage that and we look after it correctly, long term, it's way bigger value in it. Yeah. But our primary's got to be feeding ourselves and our, and our people. Coming, coming, here's a question coming back to um, who, owns, who owns the fishery and if, if we say the New Zealand public own the fishery, should recreational or public interests be managed through MPI, which is a Ministry for Primary Industries, so essentially export. Or yeah, well, yeah, you, you, you saw me point it, pointing the bone pretty heavily at MPI. Yeah. And, and I think that what's happened over the years, and this is part of this whole neoliberal way of thinking, what's happened is that um, uh, organisations or government uh, departments like MPI have become about New Zealand Inc. rather than um, looking after the, uh, the primary industries that we will own. And so, so making sure that they're getting the best value for dollar for the, the sale of those fish offshore has become that primary market. So they've basically been taken over by the commercial industry in terms of the decisions they make and the way in which they make decisions, rather than saying actually what we need to be doing is looking after what belongs to New Zealanders. So there's a little bit of a, you know, there needs to be a change in mindset there. I think the other thing that in any system going forward is that um, governance needs to change. Um, Māori need to be at the head of the table alongside government when it comes to governance. And, and that means restoring things like kotiakitanga, one of the most important things in Māori culture, that, you know, the guardianship of the environments on which we all rely. Those principles are some of the best principles you'll see in any culture in the world. And they're absolutely vital for us going forward. That uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, you know, hey, look, let's just give the fish to, to Māori. What I'm saying is that the values that, that Māori bring to the table are extraordinary. And in a governance role alongside government, alongside government equally, we would be in a much better position if it was managed that way. Yep. So obviously change is needed and there's a lot of um, political change needed. Um, what can your average listeners listening in today, what, what can they do to help? Apart from obviously, if you haven't watched Price of Fish, get on three now. Uh, prior to Wednesday and watch it. I think it drops off three now on Wednesday. It does, but it'll, it'll you'll then be able to pick it up um, on on uh, YouTube through Legacy. Yeah, yeah. So what? Apart from that, what can your average listener do to make a difference? Well, I, th I think the important thing right now is is about everybody understanding what the state of that fishery is, and and taking time to think about how important fish are to us as a nation, as yep. individuals. Um, then the process is more about from getting, getting uh, government to want to be a part of the change, which I think they are, um, getting rid of some of the, uh, the other parties who are completely owned by commercial, and uh, obviously uh, the, their decisions in terms of fisheries are, uh, will reflect that. So we need to have a government that, um, that wants to see change for the betterment of New Zealand. Yeah. Um, and then we need to get Iwi on board. We need to get Māori on board to say, look, this change is gonna be a benefit to everybody. Yep. And then we can lead that through government. The only way this, I, the only way I personally think this is going to change is the policy that Legacy's brought out called Rescue Fish, yep. um, which is bringing in a, re, a resource rental-based system, a buyback of the entire inshore. Now I know a lot of those uh, people would have been given that those fish stocks for free, but there's also a lot of people within that that have paid a lot of money to be in the game. Yeah. And you've got to reflect that. So at the end of the day, it was a discover, the government's decision to, uh, to, to give that away for free. I think we have a responsibility from a government point of view to buy that back. Yep. Um, economically, the model works. So anything that government is going to do or look at has to be bankable, has to be a viable option. So if you're going to buy back the inshore fisheries, it's reasonably expensive. Can you bank it? Will it create enough of a return from tax or a resource rental system to pay that debt back. Yes, it will. Yeah. And jobs and... And then it comes down to all of those ancillary things that it brings with it. Wellness back into small yeah. communities, coastal communities, particularly Māori communities, job opportunities, yeah. um, health-wise, access to reasonable fish. We should be eating fish three, four, 
at least three or four times a week. But for most families in New Zealand, unless you can catch it yourself, it's too expensive. That needs to change. So preventative health rather than trying to patch things up down the track. Absolutely. And if you think about, just like I was talking about before, you talk about diabetes within our Pacifica community, which is, which is through the roof. Um, who would not eat fish on a daily basis if you could access it at the right price? Exactly. I know what's, I'd eat it every bloody night. What's, uh, what's your favourite, Mike? What's, uh, if, you, if you could go and harvest anything out there tomorrow, what would you go and chase and how would you cook uh, it? Power for me. Yep. One of my favourites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just slicely thin, a little bit of soy, a little bit of honey, and just pan fried, just seared. Oh. Doesn't get any better than that. Doesn't get any better than that. I'd have to agree. I reckon that's one of my favourites. Yeah. But you try and find a legal power on this coast these days. So only a few patches left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've introduced you to one of mine. Yeah. Um, stay <laughs> top secret. <laughs> so, Mike, you're also, um, you've got your fingers in a few pies. You're also um, partners with Clark Gayford and the TV show Fish of the Day. Yes. Um, I think it's a fantastic show. I think sort of things that ring my bells about it and that's just it comes back to the whole ethos of why we go fishing and and a large part of the show is paying respect to the fish via a cooking segment and um, tracking down you know some of the some of the Pacific's best chefs and coming up with some amazing dishes how 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 many seasons have you done so far and what's what does this season have in store so this is uh, this is season five. At the end of this, we'll have produced fifty shows. Yeah. Um, of those, twenty would be in the Pacific or in the Asia region. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, w the the format you talk about was built for National Geographic. Yeah. Um, they had some if they were going to screen a fishing show, they had to have some fairly set requirements. It needed to be more a travel show than it was a fishing show. And um, I look at it from my family point of view. If I want to go on a holiday in the Pacific. I want to go fishing. Yeah. I want to go diving. I want to go spearfishing. But I have to have a destination that I can sell to my wife yep. and the kids. And that's the basis of the show. So what we wanted to do was, was sell destinations yep. that have great fishing opportunity. Um, and then and that's everything from all of the other activities you can do, whether it's whale watching, whether it's snorkeling, whether it's bushwalking, through to the cuisine and the quality of food at the end of it. Yep. And that was the, the template for the show. Um, this season... Been a, it's a bit different. We had six shows planned in the Pacific, all obviously cancelled. Yeah. So we've had to kind of rethink our strategy around what we do. Uh, the first thing that we sort of thought about was, well, let's just let's postpone the season and wait till later. Our broadcasters were pretty keen that we didn't do that. Um, and then we thought about it and we thought, well, we really want to support a lot of the local tourism operators here. So we've made, uh, made a, a conscious decision to get out there and shoot it anyway. Yeah. Um, we're keeping it local. Um, so it'll be all over the country and we're targeting a lot of those areas like uh, Rotorua and, and, uh, and um, Kaikoura and, and, uh, and Wanaka where areas that, uh, that have probably been feeling the, the pinch pretty hard yeah. um, in order to get people to think about their backyards again. Because as New Zealanders, we spend an immense amount of money every year overseas on travel. A lot of that, um, even, even, in, even if we cut that in half over the next 12 months, the amount of money potentially that could be spent domestically is, is huge. And what we need to be doing is supporting our local operators, supporting our local um, tourism centres. And uh, so each one of these shows is sort of targeted towards that, trying awesome. to promote local. Awesome. Yeah, I think um, I think it's just been fantastic seeing how uh, Kiwis have got out there, out there and supported local. Um, I've been up in Bidianga recently and the Lost Springs still got lots of people swimming in the pools. Um, motels seem pretty pretty busy, so I think it's it's the, yeah. It's, and I think that, that's the that's the underlying uh, you know the feedback we've got from the trips that we've done is that the weekends are going really well, so yeah. a lot better than they expected. But during the week, it's it's hard work, and the tourism industry is going to have a tough next twelve months. Yeah, it's going to be a you know a really really difficult time. So you know it's it's that that old adage: support local. You know, yeah. get out there, enjoy your backyard, get a chance to experience some of the things that you. You've probably seen or heard your mates do, but get your family out and uh, and give it a shot. You know, there's some cheap camper camper vans around. There's some great opportunity to experience some stuff that usually only you know the sort of top end uh, tourists coming in from overseas get an experience to to uh, to do. Exactly. So, and uh, one of the one of the shows um, is based here in Tyra. 
It is indeed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Out of and, the oldies. Yeah, out of the, out of the oldies, we wanted to go and um, and show off a bit of the diving. Um, I've I've been diving there for well since I was a, a young fella. Yeah. And uh, apart from the poor nights, this would be my second pick in terms of yep. um, places to dive. My first pick when it comes to gathering, because you know the you can the, still get some crazy exactly. It's yeah. it's it's like a poor nights without the marine reserve. And, and the numbers of fish and the variety of animals out there, some of the best seaweed gardens in the country in terms of variety of species. Yeah. Um, it is, it's absolutely spectacular. So showing that off um, and then, yeah, a, a bit of tyro. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so probably what everyone wants to know about fish of the day, what's it like working with the Prime Minister's other half? <laughs> uh, it, it has its moments. Um, sorry, Clark. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 there's lots of things that, that we have to deal with from a company point of view and from a show point of view. Um, there's, there's always um, rumours out there and innuendo, and there's always going to be people that have a different political disposition. We're not political in the show. Yeah. We're not interested. What we're interested in doing is supporting and promoting New Zealand and the Pacific to the world. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it gets annoying when we see the politics creeping in and, uh, and, and the, the sort of bullshit rumours that fly around, particularly yeah. election time. Working around his hours is often difficult. You know, he's he's got a you know he's a stay at home dad, so yeah. we've got to work that in with uh, you know with who's looking after the baby is uh, his his mother in law and and his mother spend most of the time as the as the nannies there. There's no other nanny, um, and so trying to make sure that they're on tap so that we can get away and do the filming yeah. um, has been has been challenging, and obviously the, he's got to be there to support our prime minister. So um, yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, so it has its it has its challenges. I mean, if it was uh, if it was any other presenter, and, and there was a flat day coming up tomorrow at Waiha, <laughs> we'd be driving there right now. Yeah. But we we kind of have to think a little bit further out. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we really struggle with with the show is that because of our international audience, we can't go out fishing on a day like today because yeah. we can go out and catch kingfish today. It's yeah. just going to be it's just going to be ugly. Yeah. And you could film it. And for the hardcore fishermen, it makes no difference. He's still caught a fish. Yeah, and they continue. But for, <laughs> yeah, but for our global audience, yeah. um, if it's not flat calm with blue skies, um, it's very difficult for us to sell into those international markets. So yeah. we're also limited by our weather windows on what, what we yeah. can do and when we can film. So it's a challenging show to shoot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your your job would be fairly uh, enviable for a, a lot of people out there that. Um, Maybe sitting in an office can could only dream about um, being out there filming in the in the big blue. There's probably a, quite a lot of younger people maybe listening in that um, want to do something like you do down the track. If for those people, and my daughter would be one of those. She's um, she loves the ocean. She dives. She's got an interest in preserving it. She doesn't like fishing so much these days. She's got a um, more passion about diving and um, looking after the ocean. What advice would you have to someone like that that wants to potentially make a career out of it and, and make a difference in the future? What, what are some of the things they could be doing, maybe education-wise or um, people they could look to for mentors and so on like that? I think, I think the big thing is that this path is not an easy path to take. Yeah. You're not going to make a whole bunch of money. Yeah. Um, any, any path you take where you put environment first and education and, and, uh, and trying to support and teach people about our environment is always going to be a difficult road. Um, it's, you know, it, it, we're not in politics, but it can be as difficult as politics. Yeah. Um, so I think you've, you've got to have a real will to go down that path. One of the biggest parts of, of any, um, whether, whether you're working for an NGO, an environmental group, or, or, or you're out there trying to, to sell something that you really believe in. One of the most important things is your ability to tell that story. Yeah. And the one thing I learned really quickly on was that my skill in journalism and being able to tell stories was absolutely vital going forward into that pathway that I, that I went down. Yeah. You can have the best cameraman in the world who can take the best pictures, but if you can't put that together in a story, yeah. if, you, if you don't understand how your audience thinks, how we, how we structure stories in our minds, then, then you, you know, you're, you're always going to fail. You know, there's always one, one guy in your group that was an amazing storyteller, yeah. and you remember those stories he told for, for decades. Yeah. Um, and so you want to learn that skill. So doing journalism, understanding storytelling is absolutely vital in any form you go forward, and if you're trying to convince people or change people's attitudes toward things. 
And I think that's the big thing about all the documentary work that I've done, not so much the fish of the day, but um, the 30 years of making natural history documentaries, it's been about, ed been about education. It's been about telling facts and stories supported by facts that educate people, open people's eyes, uh, make people think differently about the environment. So from that point of view, yes, it's hugely rewarding, yeah. um, but it is a very difficult path to go down. Excellent, well, that's some great advice. Thanks so much for having a chat to me today, Mike. For all you guys out there, um, make sure if you haven't seen it, go and um, jump onto three and uh, watch, watch uh, The Price of Fish. Make sure you keep an eye out for um, Clark and Mike's show coming to you later in the October. year. October. Yep. Cool as. And uh, thanks for tuning in today. See you later, guys. Take care of yourself.